we have held numerous webinars which have been uh, widely acclaimed by our members and not only our members. We have covered different parts of the world, going from Pakistan to Cairo, from the USA to Europe, and um, further afield to, uh, um, to uh, the Far East. So we are very happy to yet again be able to present uh, very well-known speakers that will show us uh, a way to get out of trouble when the trouble comes. I would now like to leave the podium, so to speak, to my uh, co-moderator, uh, Dr. Professor uh, uh, Natarajan. Natarajan, would you like to take this from here? Yes. Uh, uh I thank uh, Giampolo and the EVRS for giving this opportunity to get back to old friends and again to refresh our knowledge. And I think uh, without uh, spending more time on introduction, I think all our friends, thanks, uh, Darius has just joined. Thank you very much, uh, Darius. He said that he wanted a little later, but everybody's busy in Europe. But glad uh, everybody's awake, smart, and uh, we can start the show now. I think the first speaker is, who's the first speaker? It was Michael. 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 I'll just check. So, so Michael. Michael. Oh. Michael. Can anyone hear me? Please yeah, thumbs up. Thank, thank you, Michael. Michael is from Michael Koss is from uh, Germany, and uh, I know him from uh, his very young days, and he's still young, right? Thank you very much. I I, I turned forty already, forty one, but. Thanks for, for the nice introduction. Um, just just, a, just uh, a technical check. Can anyone see this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, guten Morgen, guten Tag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm streaming here from just south of Munich with a wonderful day. And I'm really happy to, to have the opportunity to uh, introduce two cases of mine to you and um, then to hopefully brainstorm that's the art of retina that we all have different ideas and ways to manage uh, pathologies. Um, <clears throat> actually it started with a, a straightforward retinal uh, detachment. Um, the guy told me that he got a blunt trauma a couple of uh, weeks ago he showed up as an emergency case with a macular off, uh, claimed to have the symptoms since three days. But, uh, you know, looking at the OCT with a diffuse cystic formation, I wasn't so convinced. Actually, I saw, I didn't see him preoperatively. I was just in surgery and took it from there. I'm very sorry, I have no video, but I can assure you that you know, also checking my reports. I just did a regular case. I did not hustle through the surgery and I just did a normal extensive subretinal fluid drainage from the superior retinal tear. Uh, of course, the <clears throat> detachment was macular off and, and went down to the temporal inferior quadrant. Um, the guy, young guy, you know, dynamic, I told him how to posture, but I'm not really sure he did this looking at his post uh, surgical results. So this is the topic of my talk, retinal faults, macular faults. And we were just brainstorming uh, with Carlos a couple of minutes ago that, you know, in that position, first of all, as a retina surgeon, you are taught to stay calm and to assure everyone, but uh, you know, one day after that, yet not too much gas in there. These OCT pictures are from one week after that. Um, but, you know, what do you do? And uh, there are now in the OCT days, uh, in contrast to the previous days, there are, you know, signs that you could look at. There, is, there are some page, uh, papers out that you know, uh, further describe the folds, if it's a full th thickness fold, or if it's just a lamellar fold, fold uh, if you have you know, any, any surface wrinkling, like in this example, but I can tell you the patient was unhappy. He didn't see well, 
But again, macular off situation, you know, you could play for time here. But I thought uh, we had recent experience. Some of you are, are participating in that survey with uh, the subretinal relaxation technique with large macular holes. And I thought, well, I, I did, you know, lots of subretinal uh, fluid application recently. Why waiting? That was my idea in that case. So I took him to surgery um, just four weeks later. And uh, this is, you know, I think eight times uh, speeded up. You can see slightly in the left upper corner, the time, you know, in comparison, for example, to the macular holes or to uh, submacular hemorrhages, I can tell you it took me numerous approaches to lift the, the, the retina in a case of just, you know, fixed retinal detachment. And uh, the way I did it, I, you know, uh, turned the infusion off. I counter forced with PFO and just tried to get the posterior pole uh, flat. You know, I'm not that uh, ambitious that I think uh, I need to, to wrinkle out every fold, uh, extra uh, greater arcades. I was just, you know, my aim was to get the posterior pole uh, unwrinkled. Um, I didn't do any relaxating retinectomy uh, or diamond dusted scraper manipulation. I didn't do oil, um, but here are the OCT results just post-operatively. And I think it was a good job, but the guy, you know, uh, I lost him a little bit to follow up. Um, it didn't improve further than, than 0.1. Um, and, you know, was describing basically his central scotoma, which I'm not too sure if it's of the second procedure or if it's in the first, um, in the, the nature of the first detachment. Um, a second case, um, also, oh, I'm sorry, the other one was just, you know, retinal detachment. This was the guy with a blunt trauma. And and he came, and, and in our um, data, we, we put him at 0.8, which I doubt. He had this shallow detachment at the fovea. He had superior and uh, tears uh, responsible for the detachment, of course, and inferior uh, tear pathology without detachment. And in this case, I can show you also my first surgery. Uh, again, it's... It's a straightforward case. I could drain really nicely uh, under fluid, so I, I, I didn't see the sense of using PFO uh, to, to, to attach the retina again, left him with gas. And as you can see here, uh, I didn't see anything intraoperatively, but this is an active patient. And when I saw him um, later, I was really surprised of this, um, of this picture. And this guy was really, really unhappy and pushy and so on. And as you can see on the OCTs on the far right side, this was a clear macular fold situation, whereas the first one was more a wrinkling situation. And again, I said, okay, let's do it in the same way. And in the same experience, it was really tough to get the retina up. Uh, look, I'm at 10 minutes now. It was a pre-vitrectomized eye, so you could go straight forward for the subretinal uh, fluid application. And, you know, again, managing also uh, subretinal uh, bleedings, uh, it, was, it was tough. And I realized here, I'm sorry, this is a really fast video here, that the counter counterforcing with PFO didn't work out. So I thought, why don't using also air subretinally to again achieve the unfolding of the posterior pole and because I, I wasn't really um, really good in in uh, getting rid of that uh, fold in comparison to the other case I might gonna go back again to that to that situation here intraoperatively you see I the first approach was just, you know, lifting it up, lifting it up, but I wasn't really happy with this, this formation here. I could see this interoperatively. I used PFO here, 
and and still there was no relaxation of that fold so here i manipulated on the here was the old laser i manipulated here I had a small um uh, space like a mini tear to to drain was also not uh, not um uh, successful so from this point on i thought like okay let's go with air and this is maybe a take home message or something where i thought this is something from from an adjunct to not only use fluid but to use something that is more, a little bit more expensive or at least has other properties and uh, and you know i did a fair amount of gentle massaging other techniques uh, but uh, also left him later with uh, gas and asked him to position finally right. So here's the, the outcome, which, you know, made me happy because I saw a phobia again. Uh, I wasn't too much afraid of that surface wrinkling. And uh, by pre preparing these, this talk, I saw that there was one case report in 2018 and retinal cases and brief reports, which is the Journal of, of Retina, uh, from from colleagues from France that you know put together two cases from last ten years, um, and um, and so the guy again unhappy pushing. I told Matteo that you know he took me to the to the chamber of, of physicians and now we're debating about his case, but he wasn't too unhappy because he developed cataract and asked me to do his cataract uh, just a couple of uh, months ago. Um, but another thing was, you know, by, by doing so many uh, spots, retinotomy spots, where you apply the subretinal fluid, you end up with these micro scars. And in one case, I was just afraid that the CNB might develop. So I, I preventively uh, gave him an Avastin shot, which was maybe a little bit too much of, uh, you know, precaution, but at least, you know, he was silent there. Um, Bottom line, uh, 0.5, cataract was done, patient is more or less happy now. Um, by checking the literature, OCT uh, plays more of an importance than, you know, in the, in the previous days. And there are really interesting pictures that you can look like this uh, Japanese shiitake roll. Um, and by checking colleagues, you know, apply oil, do many different things like ILM peeling, which I did not. Um, this uh, recent paper out of India uh, also, you know, used uh, a scraper, uh, which I did not, you used oil, but basically everyone uses that subretinal 41 gauge approach. So to conclude, um, I haven't had macular folds or retinal folds in years, but uh, checking some of, of the recent literature, it's not that seldom. And if it's, I think, uh, not life effect uh, or vision affecting, I think everyone would feel safe with observing. Um, the reasons are numerous, but actually I'm, I'm pretty convinced that I did a good job. But, you know, you asked yourself, did I do a good job intraoperatively, of course. Um, but, you know, insufficient posturing, rubbing, concomitant buckle surgery, there are, you know, pathology. Mateos was talking about his experiences uh, with, with uh, retinal translocation. So there are numerous uh, regions for that. Um, I think an intraoperative OCT would have been extremely helpful in my surgery, which was really hard to redetach. Um, and, and, you know, you lose your calmness, uh, maybe, which you shouldn't, because ultimately you, I managed to, to lift it up. But then arises the question, how much of a detached retina in a previously R, uh, RD is sufficient? I think the idea with uh, air is, is, is interesting. Um, and I'm just not a big fan of a tennis scraper because I don't like the the diamonds um, uh, on the surface. Um, so that was my talk and I'm happy to discuss it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much.
Um, I, I think we should try and focus on a few points here because, as you say, they are rare, but unfortunately they do occur. Uh, and when they do, we, we always wonder, have I done something wrong? So I would focus first, if anybody has any ideas, because there are many papers uh, often contradictory on what to do uh, as regards to posturing. So the steamroller technique, uh, 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 cheek to, 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 the, uh, to one side, cheek to the other side, it's, it's, it's uh, debatable and, and we're here to debate this first, uh, I, I would say, topic, which is what to do to try and prevent these faults if anybody has any ideas. Um, and, and secondly, we can talk about how to treat them. Now, uh, uh, Carlos is one that has, I think, the greatest experience. Mm -hmm. He has a beautiful animation of this, which we're fortunate enough to have in our uh, EVRS website. And he really described, be, be, I think even before we had all these very high definition OCT techniques, what really happens uh, when these faults develop why they develop and, and therefore how to approach them. So um, guys, just, just give us your ideas, maybe one at a time, we can start with Carlos and, and then carry on. Uh, and um, you know, what do you do to prevent these, these faults? Is there anything we can do? Let, let, me, let me tell you one thing for the young people that are attending the meeting. You know, the first thing is to know which cases are of high risk. And, and Michael showed perfectly which cases are. These are the cases that you have the retinal detachment to the foveal area. Then when you go down, you never remove all the subretinal fluid. You, you never, ever will remove all the subretinal fluid. Then, you know, we collect this fluid in the fovea and then it can happen. I do a steam roller. And... Michael, only one thing, technical, uh, I do a little bit different, but I, I try only to produce two retinal detachments with a 41 gauge, you know, outside of the arcades. As you as you sure know, when you inject under the retina, the fluid tends to go to the periphery, not to the macular area. Then you make fluid air exchange, you go down, you can inject more fluid with the air, and then you go and this and, and you know and you detach the fovea. I, I try not to, to perform many, many uh, you know punctures in the retina. And I sure you did it, but you didn't show it to remove the internal emitted membrane. I think it's crucial in these kind of cases to, to avoid this wrinkling at the end. But you know, great cases and you know, uh, this, this can happen, of course. No, no, great idea. We, um, you know, from the, I did, you know, fair amount of stem cell uh, surgery, not in mm -hmm. humans. Uh, and, and we tried different ways in, in, in pigs and dogs uh, with under air and so on. And you really need to be, completely precise to enter subretinally uh, there. And, and I love the way to do it sub, sub, uh, under air, the detachment. And do I understand you right? You would go uh, under air, do one creation, and then just push the fluid to the posterior pole. Did I get that right? Yeah, absolutely. You, you can begin under fluid, but you know, when you have a big ball, in yeah. the mid periphery, then you put air and the fluid tends to go down and you okay. see your previous retinotomy and then you inject more. And then you, all of this fluid will go to the macular area. And, and you just wait. And you just wait. And then you, you fluid exchange to the optic disc, fluid exchange, and then the fluid tends to dissect you right. know, the, the posterior retina. You move it a little bit with the sub tip of the finesse and then yeah. you, you detach the macro and then that's done. If you detach you the macro and then... Now I learned something. You see, perfect. Uh, because I thought, like, guys, why don't I? Why can't I detach it? But I did everything under fluid without my bottle on. Mm. I thought like that might be enough to to weaken the, you know, uh, attachment. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I should have called you before. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the problem, Michael. The problem is that once you enter uh, with the forty-one gauge, obviously the first entrance is uh, becomes uh, larger. And therefore, you have to make new uh, entry points, which is why you had several entry points. And, and it's very frustrating, actually, because you feel that you're getting very limited detachments um, and you have to go and detach that small area again and again. And as you say, then you worry that you're going to be damaging, doing more damage than you would like. I think the idea of having air is actually quite good because you are preventing the, the, the fluid from going to the periphery. 
and you're getting it all concentrated. So you're having actually, because the PFCL doesn't really give you that much weight, uh, that much push, whereas air does give you a significant uh, amount of, 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 of push uh, on the periphery. And therefore, uh, yeah, it would work very well, I think. Any, any other ideas, guys? Um, we've got Natarajan, yeah. who has uh, certainly a lot of experience. Uh, we've got Noor. We've got uh, Matteo. Please, uh, give us your so ideas. Think, uh, Darius. Uh, yeah, yes, Michael. I thank you, Gambolo. And Michael, great surgery. But surprisingly, I don't know how... I mean, I keep reading about I said, why others get pulled. And as uh, Carlos said, that we can't drain every drop of the fluid. But somehow I feel we should dry the retina. So I times, sometimes I do fluid air exchange many times, and whether with PFCL or without PFCL. And sometimes I see that uh, sheen reflects. That means it's so dry that the surface of the retina is dry and you cannot see any fluid. So I don't know. I think in my, so many thousands of surgeries I've done, fortunately, I remember having only one of my patients having this fold, and none of them had. Sometimes I wonder, I still remember the boss, Peter Kroll, came to Mumbai and say, I want to check this guy is telling the truth or not. Because even Frank Clark came, because when I said, I never switched the 23 gauge after silicon oil. And he said, oh, I cannot believe it. I said, how can you do that? You have to come and see what you are doing. So I think, I, I don't know what, what, what I'm doing right or wrong, that I don't see this fold. But uh, one thing I see is I make sure whether I do a scleral buckling, I do a drainage, whether it's explant or implant, or I do a vitrectomy buckle, I do a thorough fluid air exchange and make sure everything is dry, which uh, as I accept with Carla, I don't know whether really you, because I've seen only in giant tear, the tear slips because of the fine subretinal fluid. But here, it, this fold is also the same reason, I think. At the no, end of the surgery... No, no, no. Do you put, sorry, do you position the, these patients? This yes, is, yes, I position, yes. Okay. Steamroller? Uh, yes, yes. Or just face yes. down? Or what do you do? No, uh, more, uh, the first three days I tell them uh, face down. Because when I tell them face down uh, as much as possible, they will do only a few hours. So I think it automatically becomes uh, uh, half the time they do it. Okay. They'll come back and ask me. And we can see sometimes the RBCs on the AC. That means the patient has really been in prone position. Yeah. Exactly. Some, some. So I do. think they, uh, fortunately, many patients believe in uh, India that the uh, doctor is God and whatever I say is a gospel truth and they do it. And I'm, I probably am lucky the patients <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> Any other thoughts on this, anyone? Or shall we move on? Uh, doctor, we have got two questions from the yes, audience. Uh, one is Dr. Yes. Anand from Doha, Qatar. So uh, what he is asking that what is the panel's opinion regarding immediate face down positioning in preventing macular folds? I think we, we, no. we were actually that. discussing that. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, I was going to talk about that one. Uh, I'm the lucky the lucky surgeon, maybe also like Natarayan. Uh, I don't have, uh, I didn't have any case like with a fold. But what I did, what I do is usually I dry the uh, detachment. I usually use a heavy liquid and then heavy liquid fluid air exchange to dry it through the tears. And as usual, I mean, as anyone can do. And about the positioning, uh, for example, if the right eye, I just position the patient to the right side, to the macular side, to the temporal side. It's my easy rule that everyone in the operating theater the anesthesiologist, the assistant technicians, everyone can easily recognize just uh, face face sight to the uh, operated eye, temporal side, one, two, three hours, and then just turn to the face down, not direct face down. And I think if any, I don't leave much fluid by the way, but if any, it will go uh, through the temporal periphery. And then when you just uh, face down, I think the macula will be dry. No, yes. but this is this yes. kind of steamroller. This yes. is a steamroller. But if you have a break in the in the nasal side, you are pushing the fluid to the to the macular area. Then always, my my idea is always put the patient's face the face towards the break. If the breaks are inferior, see the patient. If the if the breaks are temporal, put the patients to temporal because you push the fluid to the break. The problem is when it's at twelve, and at twelve is very difficult because you know. 
Anything you do, you know, some fluid will remain in the macro area. If you have an OCD, you will see how always, even with perforal carbon liquid, you have always fluid under the retina. And, and um, you know. The problem is also when patients don't do what you tell them, which which uh, is is not to, uh, it, it happens. It's not unexpected. And, and so you will get complications. It's fine if you have good patients like Nat or John. But if you have normal uh, patients, many of them will not do what you say, and and um, so th you will run into this issue definitely. Um, yes, I, I I think you wanted some. Uh, some any other comments, um, Darius? Did you have a comment? I I, I saw you. I I want to mention that even in our cases, if the if there's a temporal RD, and it's the, the dangerous cases are the one where the, the retina is detaching near the fovea, bisecting the fovea. So these are the ones, and like Dr. Carlos says beautifully, it depends where the hole is, but invariably the hole is temporal. So yeah. in these cases, for three hours, like Dr. Noor said, we put the patient down on the side where mm -hmm. the break is and then put them face down. And luckily, I think we've not had this problem. But I think Dr. Cynthia Todd had come for VRSI uh, in India several years ago, and she also told us this. And I think after that, we have all been following this. And I think it's really a, a useful thing to put the head down towards the break. And invariably, like Dr. Carlos said, most of the time it is a temporal break because that's what you're most scared of. You're scared of that fold going through the macula and causing this. And this works well in our hands. So I think that's what we would recommend. You know, guys, just to make uh, sure, uh, it's like just a occurrence of two cases in years that I didn't see any fold at all. And I was just questioning because both of the patients were, you know, dynamic mid 50 guys, which it seems listening to all of your comments that he just didn't follow my recommendations for post-operative posturing. Uh, because, you know, you come back to your uh, surgeon's view and think, what did I do wrong? But usually, you know, guys, uh, I, I, I can't remember a macular fold in all of these years. And I've been doing surgery for 14 years now for that. So, but it happens in six weeks, two uh, examples, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and the guys, so, also I, my granny or someone else that I tell, hey, posture in that way, she does it. But these guys apparently didn't do it. Right? Michael, I agree with you. And, you know, I've been doing surgery for even longer, unfortunately for me, uh, almost 30 <laughs> I years. So, John Paul, I I, well, so. well, don't, don't, don't rub it in. But anyway, 30 years. But, uh, and I can tell you that I remember very few. Uh, maybe three or four. So, so actually, I was at a loss when I had to deal with these because I I had no experience, and the people that uh, actually uh, looking back, the people that developed these complications were people that did not. Were, but they, they were simply their personality did not fit in with a good patient. So they did not do what you were telling them, and 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 and. Then you know you were saying about this guy being pushy, uh, and 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 the history is blood trauma. So he's bad. so there are certain people that will not do what you tell them, and you may get that may be one of the reasons uh, that we get these complications. But even so, when you get them, we have to deal with them, and and I think that um, ILM peeling, just to conclude, as Carlos was saying, is part of the procedure. But most important is the fact that you are going to detach that retina and give it, give it an opportunity to reattach in the proper way. And we've seen how to do that with the, with the help of air. Now, another thing that we have to consider is, I think, is a time factor. I believe that you all agree the, the sooner we get in there, the better it is because you will, not, you will have less uh, developing of uh, of fib fibrous tissue, which which actually will become more and more um, adherent as time goes by. Do you all agree on that, or or uh, or not? What is your time frame, and then we'll move on. Let me tell you, and the, uh, you know, uh, when the photoreceptors in the fovea are like this, I touching themselves, you have to do it, to do it very fast. Because you know, folds disappear over time because of retinal atrophy. Then <laughs> they disappear. I saw it in the macro transformation many years ago, and they disappear over time. Then you know, if you have a fold in center and photoreceptors are facing each other, 
you have to do it. You know, one week, two weeks, you know, but do it. Less than one month. And, and I have some experience because, I, I, as I, me- I mentioned to Michael, I became an expert in this because I had patients with macular translocation and then I became an expert in some faults arrived to me. But um, um, I, I think um, till one month is, is better. So faster rather than as soon as the gas, as soon as you can really see what's happening, because obviously uh, it needs time for that to, to, to become clinically evident. Any other thoughts or shall we go on? Shall we go on to the next speaker? I think, I think we should go to the next because... Yes, please. Okay, late. I'm the next, much. right? Thank you very much. Just one brief comment. Can anyone who participates uh, in that webinar maybe consider the two links that I just put in the chat because we're looking at this still at this uh, large macular hole topic. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Then I... I'm the next, right, Nati? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, Let's go. I, I I prepared two cases. I prepared two cases, two different cases, because I saw the, the case of uh, Matteo was about the lens, and I prepared two cases. One more complex, the other more simple. Let me show you this. It has sound, then you know. Uh, I can't hear anyone. No. No, there's no sound. You don't see it? No. We no. see it, but we don't hear it. Oh. Okay, then I, I will explain, okay? Okay. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, no. Yeah. Okay, look at this. This is a typical complex case of severe retinop- diabetic retinopathy. And in some of these cases, you have to use silicone oil. Okay, let me show you how I manage this. Silicon oil has some advantages. One is to prevent retinal detachment when you have many breaks. And the other problem is that you, you can, you know, um, um, uh, accumulate blood outside the, uh, the macular area. Then let me show you first the, the left eye. We did the surgery in the left eye. We remove all the tractions. And then um, I, um, I Okay, this is the case. And then I put silicone oil, you can see some breaks down in, in left and right, I'm sorry. And then you see some blood that, you know, preventing, you know, the blood to be in the macro area, as you can see here. Then, you know, I went to the to the other eye, to the right eye, very active disease, as you can see here. Then uh, we are doing the uh, core vitrectomy, and then we are injecting. I use a lot in these kind of severe cases and use a lot, you know, these plastic materials, you can see here. And I, I find a way to enter in the subhaloidal space. Then I'm injecting viscosity, this is helon 1%, to you know, separate the posterior hyaloid and the, and the new vessels from the retina. Then with the vitreton tip, look at this, the blood doesn't flow. You prevent the flow of the blood, you know, uh, you know, preventing visual, you know, visualization. But in these kind of cases, you need by manual surgery. It's in, in my hands, at least, uh, it's impossible to do it only with visco. Then uh, intraocular pressure is uh, between 30 and 60 sometimes. Sometimes I, I do diatherme in the bleeding points. Um, you know, uh, at the end, in my head, at least, you know, I promote breaks. You know, let me tell you the truth. You know, for me, in these kind of cases, so, you know, atrophy retina is, is, is very easy to, to have breaks doing, you know, uh, any kind of, of, uh, of delamination. Then we remove all the tissue. Uh, for me, it's very important to remove the posterior hyaline to the periphery. And they use BISCO again. You know, it's very, very useful. Laser, I complete, of course, I complete the, um, you know, the pan retina photocoagulation in this patient. Then this is a wonderful case. You say, okay, my God, you know, then I cover the eye, then the day after I uncover the eye, and perfect result. You know, the patient said, Okay, I, I can see nothing. And you know, the, the big problem is that, uh, you know, unless I did, I, I did diathermy, but um, I remember a case I had many years ago, 20 years ago. Um, I have this case was doctor. The case was not that complex uh, than the case before. Then I did also basically lamination to the periphery because there were no vessels in the periphery. But at the end, I promote the break. This was an only one eye. I made a break there, and then I decided to uh, put them silicone and silicone oil. Look at this. 
then I, 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 I went to panic and, and I said, okay, what, what, what to do? And I waited for three weeks, you know, I tried to the blood to, to liquefy the lung. It, it, it didn't happen. It never happened. And I, I went there, you, 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 you know, so sticky, so difficult to remove this. It's worse than the previous, uh, you know, fibrovascular tissue I had. Then, you know, I tried to remove all of this and was terrible. Believe me, I, I remember that case. Then coming again to the last month case, I had this case. Let me my advice. 20 micrograms or RTPA separated five days apart in the vitreous cavity and then put the patient face up for 45 minutes. This is the best way. Believe me, I have other cases, of course, that they had this complication, very severe cases. This is the aspect 10 days later, and this is the aspect in the second study. Look at this. We are removing the blood from the anterior chamber. We remove the silicone oil. Then the, the blood is, is liquid. It's, it's, it's very easy to be removed. This is the day after, and you will see now. This is the last. This is last Monday, just you know, five, four days ago. The visual acuity in these eyes twenty over one hundred. And my second case is about the an intraocular lens. Look at this: uh, a patient that came in the in the in the beginning of of the pandemic. Um, three pieces IOL luxation. Look at this: was down. The the, the bag was not useful anymore. And we went with twenty five gauge. Uh, the trectomy, we remove the capsules, of course, we remove the videos to avoid you know, to have, you know, uh, peripheral breaks when you are, um, you know, uh, manipulating the lens, then it's very important to, uh, to remove all the peripheral videos as, as possible. And then I decided for this case to do Yamane technique. And then yeah, I, I, you know, some, some of you, you know me, and, and I prefer to maintain the lens, trying to avoid to remove the lens. And, you know, I created my, my I put the uh, zero 90 degrees, I, I do my marks uh, two millimeters apart from the limbus and uh, two millimeters uh, marks apart. And then we bend the needles, as you can see here. I made a mistake, I'm going to show you. This is the lens. I'm going to grab it with two forces. You have to, to have a light chandelier to see inside the eye. And then I, I strongly recommend always begin in the syringe, in the in the needle that is looking at you, the superior, the superior optic. Look at this. We put it in the in the in the in the lumen. Don't insert too much. It's not needed. It's not needed. And uh, do not do sequential. Uh, I, I I think it's better not to sequential. I, I do first one optic. I do the flange. I put it inside, and then I have all the you know elasticity of the system. And then I made the mistake here. The syringe, the, the bevel is looking at 12. You had to look at six. This is the first mistake. Some blood, it may happen. You are at two millimeters from the limbus, then you can have some bleeding, but you are going to clean the video cavity. Then I do the flange. I put the, uh, you know, a little bit disintegrated, inferior, but, you know, uh, I clean the intraocular cavity. This is the aspect post op patient 2020 in one week, two weeks period. But, you know, four weeks later, the patient, two weeks later, I'm sorry. Uh, after this, the patient came again, you know, dislocated IOL. You know, the remember that not all the three pieces of IOLs are the same, are not built the same. Look at this. And then I decided to correct this, to fix this problem using the Carle Valley lens. And, and look at this, we are going to remove both optics, of course. And then you see the attic there. This, you know, the um, um, it's very strong the the addition of the amani. You know, look at this. It's so difficult to remove the 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 attic from the from the tunnel. Then we are going to remove both optics, as, as I, men I mentioned before. And then I'm going to cut. Then I, I'm preparing the you know the incisions for the Carle Valley lens. We make an incision three and nine. I, I change a little bit my my technique of this lens. Then this is the Carle Valley lens, six point five optic uh, optical uh, you know diameter and uh, twelve point five. I think the, the total diameter. You have two other points to be inserted in the sclera, as you can see here. Then you put it in the in the injector. 
then you open the cornea, you grasp the lens, you make the Pac-Man technique to avoid to open too much, and then you we uh, you, you you inject the Carle Valley lines. This is the, the worst moment because you know the deployment is not that good sometimes, and then we are going to open and open a little bit, but in this case I couldn't uh, grasp. The initial, you know, the leading optic, then don't worry, it's a bit of Tomai's eye, then you grab the second and then you remove it. You see, we're removing the harpoon through the uh, scrotomy, then we are putting this, we're going to put this T in the pockets. And look at this, this is in the other side, we do the, exactly the same. The lens is, is 6.5, as I mentioned before, is a good, you know, size for this kind of eyes. Then you put the, the tea inside, and it is very important you suture, kind of suture this because you don't want hypotony in these kind of patients because he has a bit tectomized eyes. And then you suture. Be careful with the knife, with the, with the needle. I had one patient that I, you know, cut, you know, the apti with the needle. Just be careful with this. You know, go, you know. Apart from the from the attic, this is the aspect at the end, and the patient recovered 2020. I saw the patient. This is one year ago, and I saw the patient last week. And you know now is uh, the uh, is luxating the 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 other the other lens. The other eye is now going to to luxation, but the patient prefers to to do in the first surgery to do everything and to put the carlevale lens instead of trying first. You know the Yamani technique. And that's my two cases, and you know, um, any comments will be appreciated. Beautiful cases, Dr. John. Any comments? Yes, I think the, the the first case, the diabetic. I think the hemorrhage happening is a problem. And do you use uh, anti vegf uh, one day before or two day before for preventing? Yeah. Um, I, I, in this case, I didn't do it because it was so traction and detached retina that I, I, I tried not to, to have more traction, more, you know, a strong addition of the new vessels. And I, I decided not to do it. You know, of course, it decreased, it decreased the, you know, the, the, the hemorrhage after a TVHF if you injected before. But I have, I can show you other cases that I injected and I had this kind of hemorrhage. And um, I, I always show these kind of cases because it's, so useful. Don't try to enter again and try to manually remove it because it's so adherent. It's so tremendous. Believe me on that. You do a lot of damage by trying to remove the, 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 the blood. You will get tears simply because it, it sticks to an atrophic retina. You will get tears. You cannot remove it. It's very difficult. So the idea of dissolving it is, I think, the best way forward. Hmm. Comments from the panel. Carlos, um, uh, once you put the RTPA in, uh, you went to vitrectomy again. How did you leave the eye then? Did you fill it with oil again, or yeah. With, yeah. It, it looked like oil? It looked in this, like oil. In this, in this case, I put oil again. Yes. Yeah. You Absolutely. Put oil again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was this a, a, a an oil forever patient? Because oh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. Any other comments? Very interesting videos, so there must be comments. Yeah, um, well, my comment about the second video about uh, Carlevale lens, but my presentation, I will talk about uh, this topic, so maybe uh, I can tell it uh, later. But Great. very nice video, Carlos, as usual, fantastic. <laughs> Great, not thank you. And uh, yeah. any other, I mean, during the surgery, what do you do in case you take all precaution and then have it? And then, uh, do you advise uh, TPA and wait, or uh, yeah. during the in the during the, you have hemorrhage? Then yeah. I, I try to clean it. Uh, okay. Many people say, okay, put perfluorocarbon liquid. Be careful with perfluorocarbon liquid. This because always perfluorocarbon liquid, you know, leaves and you know, a, a, you know, a tiny, you know, liquid be, between the perfluorocarbon liquid and the retina, and then you create a, you know, um, um, a, a, you know, a very flat, you know, uh, clot, and this is very difficult to remove because it's so adherent that it, it happens the same. It's so difficult to remove. Then, you know, I try to increase Increase the drug or pressure. We are with the cannula system, less breaks in the periphery. But I, but I try to diathermize. I wait, you know, I'm trying to decrease, you know, this kind of hemorrhage. Perhaps you think, okay, 
don't use silicon oil. If you don't use silicon oil in this case, for example, so, so difficult case, um, then you will have air or gas in the beginning, but at the end, gas will disappear and blood will increase. Then you, you won't see anything. You know, this is terrible. I prefer absolutely carry the risk to have silicon oil in the eye and the, to, to have the risk of this that I can, I can manage better and I can see the awkward fundus. Because in the other way, you don't see anything. Be a quarter fee every week. The patient is very anxious. And, you know, I, I think in this kind of case, I prefer silicon oil. Um, Noor. Ah, thank you. So very beautiful cases, Carlos. You're a great surgeon. Thank you. Uh, I used to work in a government hospital that we see really bad diabetic eyes, really, that is clotting, especially type 1 diabetic, young patient, fever reaction during the surgery. You are mentioned that it is really very sticky. So just, uh, uh, I don't need to do it recently, but with the cases here, but uh, we used to do low molecular weight heparin inside the fluids, infusion fluids, until you just peel all the membranes. So if any clots, any bleeding occurs, then it doesn't clot. Uh, it can be tricky. You have to be maybe fast, remove all the things. And then after you say that, okay, I'm done with the membranes, then put the decaline or something, and then we change the infusion fluid. So it really helped in those cases. But this is related with the intraoperative hemorrhage. That you, it, because these patients also have uh, aberrant co uh, coagulation mechanisms. So their coagulation problems also occur. But the technique I do, I use very uh, gentle diatermy on top of the membranes just to lift and never to the retina but if i peel the membrane inside the retina that the cut uh, vessel doesn't squeeze blood after or during the surgery or after the surgery but they were great cases thank you this is a great thing to 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 always leave the stock of the new vessels no don't, don't try to go to the retina because if you have to apply diathermy you know, you go directly to the to the retinal vessels, and you know, leave some new vessels over the retina, just yes, the the stalks, the you know, the entrance, and you diathermize. I, I absolutely agree. Absolutely. Yes. I think the heparin idea is is uh, quite useful. Um, do you have um, uh, what sort of dilutions did you use, Noor? Do you remember? I don't remember it right now, but maybe I can write it later on. <laughs> Yeah. We we have a question. We have a question from the audience, uh, Dr. Anand, um, and uh, I inject intravitreal avastin at the end of surgery. Do you think it should help prevent rebleed? Comments on that? I, I do it. I also do it. But you know, at the end, avastin in a silicon eye. And a silicon oil eye, you know, the, the you know the turnover is very fast, and then you know, you know, it stays for hour, one hour, two hours, but nothing more. Yeah, yeah. this is very fast, you know, uh, cleaning. But you know, I do, I do it, I do it, I do. It. I just case to, sorry, to, uh, we also yeah. tend to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We also I just cases even into the oil we inject a vastin. I don't. I it it does seem to help. We have anecdotal evidence, but we, I, we find it helps. Okay. Any any other questions? Now there there is another question from from the audience. Is it advisable to retract IOL without core vitrectomy? I think the answer is pretty cl clear to this one. Who mm. would like to answer? Matteo, Matteo Forlini. Matteo. Would you remove you, would you would you remove the lens without uh, you know core vitrectomy? vitrectomy? No, no. I, no. I usually I usually do core vitrectomy. Some in some cases even complete vitrectomy because uh, I mean <laughs> it's uh, it's very very dangerous to leave vitreous yeah. in this case. You have to make sure there is no traction. That is your first. Uh, I think that the, the first focus is on leaving the vitreous and the lens, separating the two, so that when you do remove the lens, there is no vitreous traction. That is essential. Um, any other comments from the audience? From my uh, co-moderator, Professor Natarajan, any oh, any uh, comments from you? Any? I'm ready. Maybe we should move to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Yes. Yeah. Next speaker, please. That is a uh, Matthew. Eh? Matthew. Yeah. Yes, sir. So we have Matthew from. Maybe we share screen. Uh, yes, uh, Matthew. Quickly. Okay.
Okay, so you can see my uh, slide? Yes, yes. Okay, okay so um, as I already said to Carlos, uh, my topic is uh, similar to the second video of Carlos. I'm talking about uh, this uh, challenging case. Uh, it's a long story, so uh, I start. I, I, it's just one Mateo, case. Mateo, before you go on, we must also explain your slide. Now, we've got symbols that not everybody knows. This is San Marino. <laughs> so this is where you're working at the moment. So it's Italy, but it's, it's, a, it's actually uh, an independent state. Yeah? So yeah. there we go. Yeah, all right. Exactly. exactly. It's, uh, it's inside Italy, but it's not Italy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, good. carry on. It's, it's Matteo's property. Matteo's property. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe sooner or later. So, yeah. uh, the, the title is, uh, is uh, title of my topic is Breaking My Haptics and Falling in Lower Vitro Chamber. And I will show you why. So, the story is about this um, uh, young guy, 40 years old, male with high myopia and uh, with a history of amblyopia in the left eye. So all of this story is about the left eye, okay? The other eye is okay. So the left eye in 2005 had uh, trauma, blown trauma, resulting in traumatic retinal detachment. And at that time, he was operated with episcleral surgery successfully. But uh, five years later, 2010, Redetachment in the same eye. So uh, surgery again, but this time uh, vitrectomy and also cataract surgery with uh, FECO and IOL in the bag. But probably uh, uh, due to the previous trauma, the, bag, the capsular bag with the uh, myopia and previous trauma was not very um, uh, solid. There was probably zonal dialysis or instability. And, uh, Six, late, six years later, 2016, another problem. So IOL luxation in vitro chamber. So this patient again uh, to operating room for IOL removal from the vitro chamber and scleral fixation IOL. At that time, it was uh, operated with the classic scleral fixation with the sutures, 2016. So now today, uh, came, uh, this patient came to our clinic in San Marino last month, April 2021, uh, with uh, um, subluxation of this IOL. Actually, this IOL was fixed to the sclera, but uh, one of the two haptics, um, uh, uh, the suture uh, broke. So one haptic was still uh, sutured to the sclera, but the other haptic was uh, moving in the posterior chamber. Uh, and the visual acuity was 3, 4, uh, 10, uh, with, uh, of course, uh, spheric residual of plus 7. But uh, I want to underline that uh, the IOL was still uh, be be behind the iris. So at the beginning, uh, we wanted to approach this case uh, about the anterior surgery, anterior surgery. So the plan was subluxated IOL removal from uh, anterior uh, approach and Carlevale sutureless scleral IOL fixation. But then I will show you the video, many, many problems arrive. So this is the, the beginning of the case. Uh, the, the, there was a previous iridectomy because of the previous surgery. Anyway, we are uh, preparing for Carlevale uh, implantation and for uh, IOL removal. So these, uh, these are basic uh, steps, uh, of course, conjunctiva opening, uh, preparing of the scleral flaps. I, I just can tell you that uh, uh, many, many previous surgeries, so the conjunctiva was a little uh, thick, uh, was uh, not, not easy eye because, uh, you know, many, many surgeries before. But now we are preparing for, with the scleral pocket and uh, um, actually um, we, we, I was operating together with my chief, uh, Dr. Mularoni. Uh, Mularoni is an expert of anterior segment surgery. So anyway, this, was, this case was also interesting to show that sometimes uh, anterior surgery be becomes uh, posterior surgery. So these are the sclerotomy, 
but um, uh, the problem probably probably the problem was uh, that uh, uh, it was better to put anterior infusion in anterior chamber because you can see no infusion. You see the lens, the lens now, but uh, we the surgeon takes the lens with the forceps, and it seems easy. But now during the the paracentesis, during this paracentesis, boom, the haptic broke and the lens completely. Broke. So, uh, of course, the problem uh, now it's an individual. So, uh, this is the you see the haptic one haptic is missing because uh, one haptic remained in the hand of the surgeon. So, uh, now I'm trying to remove the lens from the visitor chamber. Again, uh, now I, I take my forceps trying to, uh, to uh, you see, I, I try to take the, the, the body of the lens, the optic, but again, <laughs> the second optic broke also. So again, same problem, the haptic, uh, probably, I don't know, probably these haptics was very fragile because uh, the second haptic broke again. So then it was even more difficult because you can see, it's difficult to take the lens without the haptic because uh, you don't have uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, points to 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 hold. So uh, the pupil is getting narrower, of course, and so again another attempt. But um, as I told you, when the haptics uh, uh, disappear, uh, it's more difficult. It can be more difficult because uh, sometimes the haptic can help you in the holding. So now actually another problem is these forceps. Again, the lens fall down because this, these forceps that I was using was not very, uh, was not large enough. So now the pupil is becoming narrower and ion removal is much more, uh, is harder. And uh, so uh, try with another forceps. Uh, I mean, this case, of course, uh, it's. Uh, I chose this case because it's full of problems. Usually, it's not. <laughs> usually, it's not so complicated. But uh, in this case, uh, it was. So now you see the, the pupil is very narrow, and of course, iris tissue is coming out from the corneal incision. So you know, chain again, but again, the lens fall down again. So now the iris is prolapsing through the corneal uh, opening. Now uh, with these forceps, uh, finally I have a, a, a stronger uh, holding. So now I, I, I can hold the lens very strong. The problem is the pupil, as I told you, because the pupil is very, very narrow. But fortunately this time the lens, uh, uh, okay, the lens was in P PMMA. This was an uh, old uh, lens uh, in PMMA. So now, very challenging to implant the Carlevale lens through the narrow pupil, because usually, you know, Carlevale lens uh, can be easy with the uh, wide pupil. You can see the haptics, but now this, uh, this was very challenging because uh, as you can imagine, through a narrow pupil, you cannot see the haptics. And uh, so it's very, uh, you know, Carlevale lens is very big. Of course, it's foldable, but now after closing the corneal opening, uh, actually, actually it was a little uh, blind, uh, you know, it was like uh, driving uh, in, the, in the fog or in the, in the dark, because now I just uh, take uh, the force, uh, the haptic with my forceps through the sclerotomy. And, uh, and uh, after, uh, Taking the haptic, I just uh, I just cross cross uh, my fingers because uh, I don't know what is happening. I just hope not to not not to lose the the haptic because I don't know what is happening. But finally, the haptic was uh, out. So actually, it was a <laughs> an happy moment. So now the second haptic again difficult because uh, you see I, I can take my second haptic and uh, I don't know what's happening, but again, haptic is, it's very important not to lose the haptic in that moment because otherwise it's very, very difficult. 
But uh, another problem, when I go back to retina, oh my God, severe hypotony with choroidal detachment. So probably uh, intraocular pressure was too low and probably there was some leakage from the corneal suture. So revision of corneal suture, IOP rising. I go immediately, I go back to check the, the posterior chamber, the vitreous chamber, but oh, finally choroidal detachment uh, resolution and retina is still attached. Because of course, uh, uh, it was a nightmare uh, when, when I saw the choroidal <laughs> detachment. So um, finally, everything seems uh, in order now. So the Carlevale lens uh, is well positioned. Uh, I'm just closing uh, conjunctiva and sclerotomies. Of course, uh, my fear uh, were about the cornea, the endothelium, uh, and the retina, because uh, you know all these problems, all these uh, uh, um, um, troubles during surgery could be uh, could um, could uh, provoke a suffering of the cornea and of the retina, of course, of the macula. So I show you. Uh, but actually, this case uh, uh, was very difficult, but at the end, the final result was good. It was uh, maybe even, even better than my previsions. Two weeks after surgery, you can see the cornea is very transparent, and the, the lens, the Carlevale lens, is very stable and well-centered. Uh, you can see the Carlevale lens here in the UBM. It's very... Uh, well centered and uh, well positioned, and um, surprisingly, the endothelial uh, cells uh, are good. Uh, my fear was the corneal decompensation after all these maneuvers, but fortunately, the patient young and the corneal endothelium is still good. Um, you see here the, the two haptics of the Carlevale. Uh, you can see the, um, the the superior and the inferior haptic underneath. The, the sclera and the conjunctiva. So this is very nice image. And uh, the retina, retina is good. Of course, uh, uh, very high myopic, so uh, the fundus is uh, this, but uh, retina is attached and corneal detachment, uh, no, no more corneal detachment. And uh, so OCT of the macula is good, echography is regular. So mm, last week uh, we, we saw the patient again, now, visual acuity is uh, 0 0.4. It's uh, amblyopic eye. Actually, 0 0.4 was uh, the best uh, visual acuity of this eye, even, even before the surgery. And the astigmatism, astigmatism was not, is not so high. It's just uh, minus one cylinder. And uh, hyper, uh, ocular uh, pressure is good and uh, retina, not macular edema. So that's it. J just a case of... <laughs> Many troubles, but uh, happy ending. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Matteo. <coughs> Comments? This complex surgery? Yes, I, I have some comments about the technique, Matteo. I, I, I don't know you know, but Matteo published a, a series of cases uh, trying to know where the aptics are in the in the sulcus or, or in the posterior to the sulcus and great paper, Matteo. One thing I saw first, you don't put the you don't put the flaps in the three and nine, and I agree with you. It's not necessary, but everybody show videos with three and nine, and I, I think it's not necessary and it's worse. It's more difficult. You show how to put the lens in the anterior chamber. I do now regularly, even if the pupil is normal, because you it's more stable. It's very easy to grasp. Then you know I congratulate you. Very, very difficult case. The only thing is always put a, a, an infusion in the beginning, always. You never, you cannot be in this risk because, you know, it's so difficult. But, you know, congratulations, Matteo, congratulations. I agree. Uh, usually I put anterior infusion. In, in this case, uh, it, it seems easy. You, you know, okay, I just removed the IOL. But yeah. uh, mm. <laughs> overconfidence. <laughs> never, but, never is easy. <laughs> yeah, but these IOLs, but uh, as you pointed out, these are very fragile. These are old IOLs, mm. and, and 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 the haptics always break, always break. So yeah. because they're very, very, uh, uh, they're not flexible. Uh, so yeah, you, uh, one would have expected that. My question to you is, I always like to get good visibility of what I'm doing. Uh, so would you, with the benefit of hindsight, so if you could do it again, would you maybe consider 
dilating mechanically the pupil. Uh, and again, uh, when you were grasping the, um, and it was like driving through fog, which I agree. Would you maybe consider doing that with your uh, uh, with your uh, biome? So if you're using, uh, you're looking inside the eye uh, instead of from the cornea, uh, using um, a, a vitreal, uh, vitreal, um, vitreal retinal surgery. So you could see actually where your uh, forceps were. So dilating the pupil mechanically and then using a biome or whatever system you use, viewing system you use, to see actually where the uh, haptics were of the Carnevale lens. What do you think of this idea? Okay, uh, okay. about uh, dilating pupil, you mean with retractors? Or whatever I, system you like, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Actually, uh, I, I tried to implant the Carnevale without uh, dilating pupil because uh, it was a long surgery. The patient was uh, tired. So... I said, okay, I try because uh, it's faster. Of, I mean, I didn't want to, to do more maneuvers again. The patient uh, was uh, complaining because he was tired. But actually, for, from a technical point of view, it was better to use uh, retractors. And uh, so I, I just did... Uh, Maybe you I, can save time because sometimes you, you try to speed up things, but then you end up wasting more time because yeah. you don't have a clear view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. actually, it, it was more difficult like, like I did. But uh, with retractors, uh, I, I like usually retractors to see good. And about biome, uh, I, I use biome always. Um, Actually, no. Actually, when I when I when I implant Carlevale, and I remember always uh, Carlo Carlevale teaching, uh, and really I I agree with the Carlo, of course, <laughs> I agree with Carlo Carlevale about this lens because uh, uh, the, the the very important point is uh, when you when you take the haptic uh, and in the in the pupil, I mean, it's very important if you take the haptic at the T exactly in the T and you hold it, um, no problem. I mean, in this case, uh, I didn't see anything. I just uh, was thinking about Carlo's word. So I took my T and then I didn't see anything any, uh, and, uh, and the magic, uh, because otherwise, if, if you take uh, not in the center of the T, but maybe you take, uh, a little uh, asymmetric. You don't know what is happening. Maybe you can break the lens. You, you can, can break. You can break that that key, you can you? Can. Because it's it's fragile. Yeah. So I, that's why I I was not seeing what happening, but uh, I was just uh, I was confident of my holding. But actually, uh, until <laughs> until the end, I was not so <laughs> so confident. <laughs> No, in Italy we pray a lot. We are a Christian. <laughs> okay. Can, can I just ask, because, you know, the sim similarity to Carlos' case and yours and beautifully presented. Thank you, uh, Matteo. Um, I had a couple of cases with the Yamane where I, or not a couple, but one that, you know, follows me when I think about it back, that I really ended up in a horrible uh, hypotony and a, uh, ciliary body dialysis, and then I had to take care of that again. So I think the beauty of these scleral fixation techniques is always, as you said, to get, you know, the haptics out and control this. And I think, Matteo, you created the pocket and suited nicely, whereas Carlos, you just uh, took the haptic out without a pocket. Um, did I get it right? Uh, he, he made a um, 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 trap door. He made yeah. trap doors and I made, you know, pockets around the initial incision. And, and I think, good. yeah, I, I, my question to him is when you, because I, I saw you entering in the eye parallel to the limbus. Okay. Then, you know, the T is parallel to the limbus. And then, you know, I, I do it vertically. Yes. To have the entrance like this. And the tea like this, just to avoid, you know, to have right. the, the tea again inside. But do you close your 
when you met the trapdoor, and I, I saw only the sutures in the trapdoor, but right. I didn't see the sutures around the optic. And I had a case with uh, choroidals after, with your with, with the same thing as yours. That was my question. <laughs> Yeah. How do you, have, you yeah. have to be careful because you have to suture. Because you know, if you leak, if you leak, you remember you have the three sclerotomies plus the two incisions for this. These are five or six incisions in the eye. Then you can have leakage. And at the end, in a myopy, <laughs> maybe a problem. Mm -hmm. I had one. I, I in these cases, I always suture the three sclerotomies of the trockers. Sure. So I close the three sclerotomy of the trockers. Uh, I close the scleral pocket, of course, but I don't suture the haptic. Uh, Around. Uh, mm. the, the, the hole is, uh, was 25, uh, 25 sclerotomy. Uh, and so it's... Actually, the trap, to, if I may, the trap door, which is uh, reminiscent of the old technique of you know, scleral suturing, as we did with the normal uh, lenses, uh, will give you uh, some pretty good uh, water tightness. Because if it's large enough, as you showed, Matteo, you had large trap doors, and you cover that, it's very similar then to having almost like a... Uh, trabeculectomy, if you want. Um, so um, you do get good uh, closure with those trap doors if they're wide enough. And and then because the suturing that you apply at the corners, uh, if it's tight, it really gives you good water tightness. And the fact that you also suture, as I would in these cases, uh, the um, uh, the ports, uh, the the entrance uh, uh, ports, is also an added guarantee. Uh, so yeah, I would agree that I would not suture that either. I think the trap doors, it, it, the two techniques are slightly different. So the trap door gives more protection than a Carlos technique, which he would definitely have to suture. And I, if I were using that technique, I would also suture like Carlos does. Any uh, other comments? I must admit that I've been using three of them, and the best thing is the trap door. But I suture around the optic, the 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 optic. <laughs> be careful because I had okay. choroidas in one case, and you know, as they say in this country, better safe than sorry. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Matthew, okay. Uh, Matthew, there is a question from Dr. Ash UK from the panel. Given that three-piece IOL are not designed for sulcus fixation, are the panel, including you and the Carlos, more in favor of Carlevale IOL than others? Um. Well, actually, in, in my experience, uh, I, I really prefer Carlevale lens or Iris, Iris Claw. I mean, uh, usually my choice are Iris Claw or Carlevale Scleral IOL. I usually don't, don't do a Yamane. I, I, believe, I, I, I think Yamane technique is very nice, very elegant. Uh, but I mean, uh, li like Carlos showed, if you have uh, a three pieces IOL inside the eye and it's uh, in uh, the optics are still in good uh, shape, uh, of course uh, it's the best choice. But uh, if uh, if the IOL is not uh, good, is all this is damaged, I, I just remove it and I I choose a Carlevale. Or I, I I would say that the great advantage of the uh, technique, Yamada the technique, is the fact that you're working with a closed eye. So you're not risking, uh, as you said before, choroidals or anything of the sort. Once that you cannot use the lens, which is in the eye, then you need to uh, have a more stable lens. And so uh, obviously you look at things like the Carlevale lens. Yeah. Um, I don't want to... Um, interfere with others. So uh, any, any other questions or comments or shall we move on? Professor Natarajan, yeah. so tell I, us what to do. Yeah, Would you yes, like I think we will move on. And I have suggested to Mitali in the mail, I already mailed all of you, that Mitali will copy the questions and the, whoever is asked questions, she'll have their email ID. And okay. I think the speaker will give a detailed answer so that uh, we cannot cover everything and there are questions coming. Of and course. I think in the want of time, even Michael has uh, mm. mentioned about the survey. 
I'll request him to post it in the WhatsApp group. I will email it to people, and I hope uh, we'll work with the Indian uh, Veterans Association of India also. I invited uh, all of them, including the more questions. India, the more questions. The more questions we get, the, yeah. the greater the interest. So we're very, yeah. very happy for people to ask questions. Yeah? Yeah. And we'll try to address yes, They're them. asking. That's right. Oh, that's good. That's so there's a question from, uh, there's a big long question. Do you want to answer that? In vitrectomized eye, eye oil with broken haptic falling repeatedly on posterior pole retina. I prefer lots of PFCL to avoid injury to retina and hypertony as well. Two intrap small pupil is sometimes good indication for AC eye oil or iris claw. I think whatever as a, I don't do any of the IOL, but I will suggest posterior part of iris claw. And I have seen class Seca doing for a long time. And Matthew also. And, and Cesare Fordini used to do it as well. Yeah. This is from Dr. Manoj Sasavade, which is, a, he's from Aurangabad in Maharashtra. And where uh, he will host you if you come there, because the Ajanta and Ellora caves are there. Okay. Uh, Matthew, sir, Carlos. Uh, about this question, yeah. uh, be careful with perfluorocarbon liquid because uh, it's great idea to, to put perfluorocarbon liquid. The problem is that the eye is open, and then you 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 have perfluorocarbon yes. liquid, and then the you know the stream is making you know, you know thousands of bubbles, and you don't see anything. And it happened to me. <laughs> and, you know, put in a Carlevale lens in a tra traumatic eye, and then I I, I, I opened the infusion. A lot of bubbles before carbon liquid was so difficult to see the, you know, the Carle Valley lens. But at the end, was perfect. I removed everything. But, you know, you had some bubbles in the anterior chamber, in, you know, anywhere. And then be careful when you have the open eye with before carbon liquid. Be careful. Yeah. And actually, I want to make a question to you. To Actually, in your experience, because uh, uh, many people have fear of the IOL, falling down to the macula. But actually, in my experience, uh, usually th there is not severe damages because IOL just... Uh, Floats. 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 Gently, yeah. Yeah, I yeah absolutely. I, I, I don't use it. I don't use it. And you have the problem with that... If, for carbon, uh, because as Carlo said, perfluorocarbon injection could provoke more problems. But the lens falling actually... Yeah. There is a difference between a foreign body, so if you have a, a piece of metal or, or whatever inside the eye, and the lens, which is lighter and also has a greater surface, so when it falls, it floats down to the bottom. It doesn't just drop like an anvil. Yeah, so, so that, that is the difference, I think. Yeah. I, I don't use it. If you use it, don't put a big bubble because the lens goes to the meniscus and goes outside from the, from the central view. And the third, and perfluorocarbon liquid is very good in one thing, is to maintain the eye. It doubles the weight of the water. Then if you have a very unstable eye, put perfluorocarbon liquid just to maintain and avoid corroids. And this is, this is a great idea. But don't fulfill the eye because then you will have the stream, you know, fighting with the surface of the bubble and then you will have thousands of bubbles. And, you know, it's good to maintain the eye. It's not bad to put perfluorocarbon yeah, The second question is about uh, uh, narrow pupil. Uh, I agree that uh, small pupil is indication for iris claw, IOL, uh, but uh, in, in my case, uh, we already opened the Carlevale. <laughs> you know, the Carlevale lens was already opened and uh, I didn't plan. And, and, uh, small pupil. Uh, Matthew, there's a question from uh, Philippines, Manila, that uh, will you add uh, epinephrine in the anterior chamber in maintaining dilatation? And, and they have called you nevertheless great case and very brave perfecto. How oh, would you have the uh, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, I, I also used uh, to maintain dilation, but uh, the pupil get, uh, got narrow because of the uh, manipulation, uh, you know, uh, the, too many manipulation, and so iris tissue uh, became uh, narrow, of course. Can I just take the... Yeah. Can I just take the opportunity to thank Perfecto. He, we organized another EVRS uh, uh, webinar in the Philippines and it was absolutely smashing. We had a great attendance. So once again, Perfecto is always there. Great EVRS member. Thank you. And uh, yeah, just want to say thank you. Right. Ciao, Perfecto. Dear Perfecto. <laughs> yeah. And also, will you please show the design of 
Carnevalo I will from uh, like, I I think you can find that on the internet yeah. it's uh, it's it's easy oh, it's it's it, right. yeah this, can you yeah. see it yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is the design. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's great. great. I think we'll move on. Uh, thank yes. you, Carlos, for a wonderful, uh, mind uh, boggling and mind stimulating <laughs> uh, talk. So good. So uh, you can invite, I think, next is uh, Darius or Noor. Darius, I think. Yeah. Darius is already ready. Okay. Good. <laughs> so, code red. Everything is red. Good morning, everybody. And uh, <coughs> I I'm think happy to say Darius <laughs> is a. Uh, Alumni from Shankaratrala, from where I am from, and uh, he's in practicing in Delhi. And he and his uh, uncle, the Dr. Sarah Shroff, uh, we work together. He's a past president of uh, All India, uh, Vitriatal Society of India. So after, thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind invitation to Dr. Natarajan and to EVRS. And after all this, uh, I think high five stuff. We're going to discuss the basics. We go back to the basics of scleral buckling. And this is a case which still gives me nightmares, even when I think of it now. So I wanted to share and take your opinion about this case. So it was a 31-year-old man from a remote part of India. This is a very <clears throat> part of India in the north. It is only accessible by flight. It's, it, there's no road to that area. He has a drop-in vision for one week. Vision is six, nine parts. He was a high myop. And the macula was just off. So this was a macula of RD and there were two horseshoe tears. So you can see one tear in the detached retina and there's one horseshoe tear in the attached retina. So uh, I would just like to tell you that normally if you're comfortable with the procedure, I mean, we should go ahead. With it. So normally I always drain doing a cut down. But under the influence of peer pressure and what was fashionable, everybody said try needle drainage. So this is one case I tried needle drainage and I'll just like to show you the video after this. Yeah. So you can see that This is the, we tried with the needle and lots of blood is coming out from, this is something we don't want to see. In panic, we try to put a cautery, but I don't know whether that's required or not. We cautery that area. When you look inside, there's blood, there's blood at the fovea. So this stage, would anyone like to do anything else? Would what would the panel like to do at this stage? Would, would you like to go in or just... My, my, my question to you is, did you plan before to do a buckle beat or or you plan to do a scrub buckle and after a hemorrhage appeared, then you decide to vitrectomy? On, only plan, only a scleral buckle. We didn't plan a vitrectomy. Okay. Then I think you did the correct thing. You know, you don't leave this under the retina. Yeah. Okay. You have to you go in. So I just show you the. So then we put puff PFCL, puff fluorocarbon liquid to displace the blood. We put a chandelier. I don't know whether my voice is coming. Chandelier illuminator to help with the dissection. And I thought we should remove as much blood as possible. So we tried a bimanual technique, made a small retinotomy. And you can see it's very difficult because the blood has clotted. It's sticking to the back surface of the thin retina. But I thought since the configuration of the retina detachment was such, you don't want to leave it. I knew that all the blood could not be taken out, but we thought, <clears throat> let's try to debulk it. As much of blood as can come out, we should take it out. And this was a slow and painful process, but... I didn't want to make multiple retinotomies. I thought we just confine ourselves to one and try to take out as much blood as possible from this. PFCL bubble is there protecting the macula from whatever it's possible and trying to displace the blood. And we do a fluid air exchange. We do laser around the retinotomy and we put oil. So this was two days post-op. It looks quite horrendous. Of course, this scan is not exactly through the phobia. So I've cheated a little bit, but just showing you how horrible the scan looks. And this is the follow-up. Day five, the color photo OCT, one month, two months, visual acuity by God's grace has improved to 618. We did an oil removal at three months. And uh, this is the four-month picture. 
Seven months, the blood seems to have dissolved quite a, gone quite a bit. At one year follow up, the vision is improved, fortunately, to 612. This is the picture. But you can see photoreceptors are quite damaged on the OCT. The blood is much less. So um, I, I think a lot of thoughts. Why, why did I put oil? Only gas, role of TPA. So I think I will move on to the panel and we can discuss this case now, please. Uh, let me tell you one comment. Uh, of course, the blood at the end, the, the remaining blood under the retina went down when you made the fluid exchange, then it goes down and to, to a macro again. Then, you know, this is a big problem. Uh, the thing, you know, we can discuss this forever, but, you know, perhaps it would be better to go to far periphery and make a larger break in the periphery supported by the buckle and then with an aspiration, not, not with the forceps, with the aspiration, subtic cannula go under the retina and try to move, you know, the the um, the clot up, you know, but you, you, these are difficult and challenging cases and, you know, this is great, it's great. What role do you think TPA could have in this case? That was mine. <laughs> Yes, I would like to, would, uh, should I have injected subretinal TPA, waited for it, it to have dissolved and then removed it? What would the panel advise me? Mm. Well, I think you could have just injected uh, intravitreously and see how the eye reacts because uh, as, as, as also Carlos said, the rebleeder is that that you're afraid of. And I think you got lucky with the oil counterforce that it didn't bleed more into the subretinal space. Uh, but that was my first thought. Why initially do the vitrectomy and not go through drugs first and see how the eye reacts? Um, do you have RTPA available always at that time? Because it's a quick also then, you know, management. Yeah, we would have it. Yeah, we could have used okay. it. Yes. Okay. Uh, the reason I didn't want to put gas only was there were two reasons. One is that the patient uh, would need to fly so that was one, of course, that is not, so, yeah. not so important. Second is because the configuration of the uh, RD was such it was just coming through the macula, like I, some of Michael's cases right. where that fold formed. I was worried that even if you try to gravitate the blood, it, because the rest of the, uh, the retina inferiorly was attached, it would all come in, the whole crescent of blood would come and sit, sit, even if we put him in face down, I was not sure how much it would be able to push it to the side. So, I don't know whether we try a steam roller or try to put him left lateral and then gas would have worked in that condition, but I was too scared, so just used oil. Oh, but great case. I, let me, uh, let me uh, ask. You, you, you. No, 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 Carlos, I, I was just going to say what, what you were saying. So, so go ahead, go ahead. No, no, about the case, in the, in the first picture you, you showed, uh, this is for all of you. You know, this, you plan wonderful, you know, only a scrub buckle. But in these kind of cases, when the same case of Michael, when you have these, you know, tiny detachment in the foveal area and you do your scrub surgery, it's very frequent that you have uh, this, you remain in subretinal, subphobia fluid for, you know, six months to one year. Um, does it make your, uh, to change, uh, you know, to be tried to me? Because, you know, this fluid is terrible. You know, the, the patient say, okay, I cannot see, I cannot see, I cannot see for six months to a year when you have this remaining, you know, subretinal fluid. Uh, this is a question. This is not a. This is a question. If you change your mind to do only buckle to be tricked to me, if you have a, this, you know, uh, kind of retinal detachment in the forehead area. Yeah. Um, Any yeah, Noor, is is that your voice I hear? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, uh, Gianpaolo. So, Carlos, thank you for the command. You are extremely right. But the technique we do usually is we put the buckle, we drain, and then put some air, and then. Positioning, so mm -hmm. it com comes like a buckle pneumatic. So uh, it helps, I think, for the subretinal fluid uh, to remain, uh, not to remain in fluid. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Okay, but here the question here that, that I think we're all asking is: we have the problem. Forget about what we should have done, but we have the problem. We have the blood. It's it's very close to the uh, fovea, uh, to the macula, and, and actually to the fovea from what I can see. What do we do? How do we get rid of that hemorrhage? Is uh, the technique correct? Trying to make a retinotomy, which is 
uh, quite close to the posterior pole and as you did, or uh, injecting TPA, detaching the peripheral retina with fluid, adding, say, a heavy liquid to displace the blood to the periphery, or as Carlos was recommending, just uh, perform, I think, Carlos, something similar to macular translocation. Yeah, you, you want to make a large uh, um, uh, um, peripheral uh, uh, retinotomy, flip the retina over, and then aspirate with, the, uh, with your cutter. Which of the three techniques is, is most appropriate? Is there not, one that we not, could choose? Not, not so big. You don't need so big. This is a, no, no, you not, know, not, not as big, but, big. But similar, similar. Yeah, but similar. peripheral, peripheral. I think peripheral. the key is peripheral. Absolutely, yeah. peripheral. Yeah, yeah, peripheral. But it has to be a quadrant at least, because otherwise you won't be able yeah. to. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you won't be able to flip the red so, cell. So, which of these techniques is most appropriate? I think we all have different ideas. So, what would you suggest? No, I think you wanted to. Yeah, speak. quick, rapid fire. So it's a great case. Thanks, Darius, for sharing. I have never experienced such hemorrhage, but you have managed it, I think, very well. What I have, done, I thought that what I have, what would I do? I would just uh, suture the uh, sclerotomy air, but already if you have done it with a needle, maybe that's not uh, necessary. And then go, especially, I wouldn't wait because it is just settling the macula. It's a very big hemorrhage. And then uh, I would vitrectomy. During all the which uh, after posterior hyaluronic removal, maybe injecting some retinal TPA, and uh, it gives me time. I would wait for the go for the peripheral vitrectomy and everything, maybe half an hour. I don't know, and then uh, put a uh, drainage retina to me because it is a clot. I mean, I think you did a nice job because it is very difficult to remove all, uh, and I think uh, TPA could be can be uh, more helpful. And oil, not gas, oil. Thank you. I think for the sake of the audience and for our knowledge, could all the panelists uh, tell us their favorite way of draining in a scleral buckle, cut down needle, any tips and tricks for the younger members of our audience today? I drain right. in all my cases, yeah. Drain, drain, yeah. What, yeah. What, what, what instrument? Do you do a scleral cut down or do you use a needle? And if so, which gauge needle would you use? Apollo? Scleral cut down. Very careful. Use. I reach. I, I reach uh, the choroid. I see, uh, and then carefully with diathermy. I just. I just uh, go through it. Absolutely same. High same. diathermy. And I, I, I go. Yeah. I go. I go near the lateral muscles. No. Not. Not. You know. Uh, I take care of this. You know. I go uh, as as much as possible near the. You know the lateral and medial rectus to yeah. to avoid big vessels. Would you like to suture the site of drainage or would you just uh, leave it alone? Uh, I suture. Yes. yes, I suture also. I don't. I don't. Mm. But Dr. Michael, Dr. Dr. Oh. Natarajan, I think Dr. Natarajan is one of the pioneers of buckling and naturally Dr. Shankar yeah. Natale. So, so uh, somehow, I, I, yes. Yeah, no, I, I still uh, do scleral buckling and I'm actually trying to make a treatise of uh, scleral buckling because we got 6-6 six, six, uh, N5, 20-20 N5 uh, falling buckling, even though I'm an aggressive vitreoretinal surgeon and I keep learning from Carlos and uh, Gampolo and Cesare and Matthew, but I still love to do the appropriate cases with the, but I don't, I somehow I was not impressed with the needle, needle drainage when it came as a, uh, as a fashion in India. I don't remember who, I think probably Steve Charles came and popularized it and, <laughs> and Dr. Patnaik <laughs> who practiced it. Somehow I like, uh, I modified the drainage by actually making a flap because I was in a, a, a Charles Keepens uh, trainee in the sense that Dr. Patnaik trained as an implant surgeon. So from implant, I became an explant surgeon. So I thought best is to have a flap, like a trabecular thing and make a flap, make a, so you see the uh, the wide open sclera and you can see whether the under magnify and microscope. And I, start, I started the uh, my, micro, using microscope for a scleral buckling in 84. And uh, when Dr. Badinath and my other teacher, Dr. Chandra Embram was using loop to do the scleral buckling surgery. And I used to tell him, I have Zeiss microscope and doing vitrectomy and for scleral buckling, you're removing it and putting the loop. I said, I don't want to use loop. So I always used uh, scleral buckling. The microscope, yes. Microscope. So yes. I think uh, microscope made the difference for drainage. And I like 
total drainage that that means it is like a, almost like a retractable fluid exchange done i do i know that i mastered the technique of uh, subretractable fluid drainage and i know when to stop and when i open when i do the check the immediately on the table that may attach moderate buckle height and i know if you tight too much you have a eight to appearance or you have the high myopia later so i think i am probably have 37 years of experience and i have patients who are one eyed that time and with the buckle done so i think one is if a hemorrhage happens i am glad uh, you are showing it and i, I think young surgeon should uh, uh, have the guts to show but i think also learn a lesson if it happens don't panic and i think you use the word panic and i agree and i think if you are mentally alert if you follow the last chapter uh, surgical self education by steve charles you actually give, have a game plan it is like playing a soccer vitreoretinal surgery or any surgery but particularly vitreoretinal surgery you go with the game plan and this hemorrhage happens so you should have a contingency plan in the mind like a logarithm and uh, again you may have keep changing what do you change because uh, when you play soccer or football you have to change the game as per the opponent team you cannot uh, say i have practiced i do this but your opponent will do a different way so i think uh, what you showed is great and i think a excellent result yeah yes. the time only problem is how to counsel the patient when you have a, a, a complication like this and then and then, and, then, and then what the colleagues will tell which is what i am trying to uh, popularize in india when there's a problem too, i always use this word i don't know what was the situation in the surgeon's hand on that particular time maybe in my hands also it would have happened like that i think your surgeon has done the wonderful many times the patient say, oh you know no you are supporting to avoid a medical legal case i said maybe but i you imagine what are you going to go through that agony of saying that the doctor is wrong may a surgeon i said he has done a beautiful surgery you got a vision enjoy it no doctor wants to have complications we all try our best and if they happen uh they happen uh and let me just uh say something that you already pointed out one i don't have many many surgical truths to give but one mainstay is that i like to see what i'm doing always i believe if you see what you're doing you can do it better so the the idea of sticking a needle without seeing what happens i don't like the idea of a uh, scleral cut down being able to see the layers as you're going down until you reach the the plane that you're interested in again is what i like so you we have a microscope we have tools to do that uh we do it that that's the best way um sometimes some people would also put traction sutures on the uh, scleral cut down i personally don't but it can be done just to enhance your view and to see uh, when you reach the desired plane let me just add something else to to that i agree i agree, I agree Gampola, and I, i remember even because my father was ophthalmologist he always used to tell me the ophthalmology don't do anything blind no. something blind no. iris you don't know you have to no. find a way how to see you don't it. know what happens yeah, yeah. so he says so, always everything should be visualized darius let me let me congratulate you not uh, mateo and darius and uh, you have shown some incredible cases and and you know uh, this is the spirit of evrs Uh, generally when you see uh, many other webinars other societies you think all oh, these surgeons must be god because they're so good they never get complications everything is perfect um the idea of being human and and having problems and 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 having the courage to to show them uh, just proves that you're great surgeons and you also are very intellectually honest and this is really the the and we can learn from this we don't learn from perfect surgery because perfect surgery we know about it's the imperfect surgery that comes from complications which we learn from and and this is really the spirit of evrs that many have tried to emulate but have not succeeded in doing um i will stop here carry on thank you thank you so much great i think that is i think as you said a uh, little buckling every surgery has this and i think you showed that and i think you have to have that uh, mind that you have a game plan and that's why as you rightly said in chakranetla we have this drawing check that means we actually do a detailed retinal drawing as given by the uh, the jerem screen and what uh, dr rosanthal has given in 1968 i think which is there in uh, highlights of ophthalmology which is like a gospel now i attach that as a manual 
to the fellows who join with me and they have to go through it how to do a retinal drawing and then they show me it's not just retina photographs or you have a 360 degree optus photograph and say uh, the break is here i said no you should do the optic disc to the periphery every blood vessel track it and the patient also is happy the doctor is examining me in so detailed way so i think you are a master of the uh, the architecture of the retina but jampalo uh, and and professor natarajan i have just one big uh, plea yes. here because i really think it's so important yeah. what you said and to talk about complications and management it's much easier to do this in this fashion online internationally there is no second th thinking here and i really encourage you to maybe post covid to carry on with something like this grand rounds a thing periodically it doesn't have to be permanent but you know you cannot or you're most more hesitant to show these cases in london uh, Giampaolo, for instance, right, um, and and to get a true feedback. I really enjoyed uh, Darius's case here, and I I would have maybe another approach even to discuss. Um, but something like this international grand rounds is true EBRS spirit. Thank you very much, Michael. That's a grand idea, and as usual, uh, coming from a, from an EBRS member that has been with us for so many years. Uh, yes, absolutely, we will do it. And 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 uh, we'll get you involved as well if you if you will give us some of your time. So, so yeah, there is a question you. or a, a suggestion, Yampolo. There is a question. The doctor Manoj Chasar has written. He wants to use uh, support the inferior heart shoot tear with buckle and do a cryo or a laser and use TPA and air gas to displace from macula in a young eye myo. We talk to me only if persistent subretinal clot. Does the panel agree to it? Is asking. There is. Yeah, we, that is a possibility. That but is again, I was, I was worried about the air not being able to displace this blood enough because of the configuration of the RD. The, the configuration of the detachment was such that I was worried that any sort of tamponade like that would push it more towards the junction between the attached and the detached retina. So that was my thought process. But yeah, this could be tried, definitely. Uh, okay. Also, after TPA injection, we may aspirate it because the cloth yeah. may become yeah. loose uh, after some yeah. time. Yeah. My idea is uh, I mean, it's alone and only my idea. The, the, the question is how long you have to wait. So if you have to wait uh, about half an hour to 40 minutes for the TPA to act, uh, what are you going to do in that time? You, you go and have a cup of coffee and, and the patient <laughs> is on the table. Uh, so that, that, that is an added consideration. In theory, uh, you put TPA and then and then you have to wait necessarily. Then you can try and displace it with um, PFCL and aspirate it, or you can try and put uh, a gas in, have the patient position. This is all very fine. But one of the issues is what do you do in those 30, 40 minutes? Do you, you know, it, it, it creates a problem in, in, in the operating room. But, but it is a good technique, obviously. Shall we go on? Shall we go yeah. on with... Uh... So I have a, uh, Michael, I have one suggestion, as you rightly said, international grand round. I'm actually collecting uh, the success of uh, scleral buckling done more, maybe more than 25 years back, and maybe uh, we can have all of us here, whoever is doing scleral yeah. buckling, can collect the patient and make a, a grand uh, paper on scleral buckling. And I think a few years back, we had a comparison of vitrect primary vitrectomy versus scleral buckling. And then finally said, scleral buckling is having an edge over primary vitrectomy, but I think the primary vitrectomy was forced uh, or maybe a fashion. So I think we have to have an intellectually uh, truthful answer, which is good for the patient. Maybe we do it as a Yes, absolutely. I think I we think, should go to the next, yeah. uh, I, I think the, the two techniques one. should be used, yeah. yeah. Um, again, a vitrectomy is easier. So yes. it because it's it's easier to to pick up and people will go for that. But think of all those inferior breaks where you could mm. do away with vitrectomy and maybe use buckles. But okay, we won't go into that. Can we carry on with the prettiest of the surgeons? I'm sorry for the others. But. Yeah. So uh, that is you have to stop stop sharing the screen. That is. So, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Now the, the as uh, our grandpa said the star performer of our uh, beautiful surgeon from Turkey, Nuraka. 
gentlemen dinner, really. Thank you. I'm just waiting to share my screen. And is it, it is visible, right? Yes, thank you, Nora. Yeah. Yes. So you, you can make it a full screen. It is now. Oh, yes, okay. yes, we have a full screen. Thank you. Thank you again for this nice opportunity to talk and discuss. I really enjoy the cases. Mine is maybe not such a big complication, but uh, I hope you like it. So this is a case, a 43 years old male from Iraq. Uh, after during the bombing, he was in the car and the car window exploded. So he has bilaterally open globe uh, trauma with glass interrupter form bodies and LP with both eyes. So this is a surgery of the uh, of the left eye, the left eye. So uh, as you can see, uh, I'm sorry, uh, pardon, yeah, the, the surgery. I put the buckle and then I just uh, deal with the snakeias and I already uh, sutured some of the corneal wound in the inferior area. So I realized that the whole the lens capsule was perforated. So I go with for the lensectomy. And at this stage, I, I'm not sure that I really cannot enter into the vitreous right away. So, and I also, there's dense hemorrhage. I uh, prefer the six millimeter long 20 gauge cannula, longer cannula. So as you can see the dense hemorrhage, as I go uh, the, through the case, I remove gently, just uh, not to introduce any more traction on the retina. I can see that there is a bleeding inferiorly and uh, the glass objects already attached into the, into the hemorrhage. Uh, as I uh, do the lensectomy, uh, the capsule is renewed. Uh, I just open the area. Then after tramcinolone, after some time, for example, the posterior hyaluronic is really very attached in this case. He was a young, a young case. And so I just try uh, with the aspiration. You can see that I try many times from the disc and around. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, detach uh, easily. So I just go around, do some cleaning from the vitreous, uh, vitre peripheral vitreous, and then the, remove the bulk of the vitreous and the hemorrhage, and then maybe for the second intravitreal triamcinolone, then uh, with time, maybe in three, five minutes, it becomes easier because of the fluid turbulence. Uh, it becomes much easier than uh, to uh, detach the vitreous. So you can see here, I just go on. I don't. Uh, I don't want to drop the glass foreign bodies right away. I just leave them to the uh, to the last uh, last maneuver. I just uh, uh, do the sclerotal indentation, the peripheral vitrectomy, uh, because I'm gonna remove the uh, foreign bodies through the cornea I plan because I don't want to cut a large sclerotal wound in this case at that time. It's an old case, by the way. So uh, the capsule is removed. Uh, all preparing for the iris hooks I already placed. The, Capsule remnants, I always uh, clean through the ciliary process, as you can see, the damage in the inferior temporal area. So this is the uh, removal. Uh, I picked that was, I had uh, four muddy forceps from door. It is, I like it, it's a big forceps that uh, can, uh, I could take out, grab this uh, glass, and then uh, I bring it to the uh, anterior chamber. I uh, already put the corneal uh, cuts, and then I stop the infusion uh, transiently. I inject a copious amount of viscous uh, material, uh, viscous elastics. And then uh, with this four steps, for example, I, uh, maybe I was excited because I prematurely, I did something. I touched with the four steps. With this four steps, you just grab the four body and then do anything else until you remove it from, uh, from the eye. If you do that, it is open. The, uh, the grip is open and then I lose now, I just go forward a bit after the foreign body, but it is going down now. So the infusion is opened, I uh, go back. So that is my complication. That is the falling down of the foreign body. It's the second one, now I'm just uh, realize my mistake. The same maneuvers, I repeat, I go through the cornea. Uh, this is the first one, a bit of health. And we shouldn't do the incision of course, uh, small because it is just tackle and damage the cornea a lot more. And we have to sometimes move around the foreign body inside the eye to better uh, better grabbing uh, area, ergonomic side. This is the second one. Uh, but this went uh, pretty well. I already have some uh, decaline in the eye, macula, and also some viscous fluid because viscous acid already dropped in because of this. I injected and they dropped. 
So the rest is the standard surgery. I checked for the vitreous remnants again. I didn't try to uh, tear the laser, and I did a 360 laser in this case at the end. I didn't try to um, uh, uh, remove the subretinal lots in the inferior area. There was uh, inferior tears, uh, and then the iris needs to be sutured. It is completed, but the iris suture site, sometimes I needed to, I think, uh, close the infusion again because I felt already with the decaline, I was a bit confident about that, but after the suture is uh, done, suturing is done, I complete that one, inject some viscoelastic here. I see also another thing happened in the traumatic eyes, a serious, because of the hypotony, maybe transient hypotony, I was lucky that there's serious serous uh, choroidal detachment locally, not affecting the macula. And then uh, the gas and the silicone injection. As you can see, there's some bleeding. The bleeding is will be washed out with some myostat injection into the anterior chamber. And I check the pressure, inject some more silicone, and closing the eye. So that's the case uh, of mine. Uh, so just uh, why I depict that one, because intraocular foreign body removal can be tricky, as we have already talked with the lens drop also, but this drop and even a glass one can damage the macula if it's uh, just on top of the macula. Uh, I already explained that this forceps, I like it, but it is that we, have to, we shouldn't move our hands with this forceps, because when we move it, it is just open and then foreign body falls. So the, another option, maybe we can put the intraocular foreign body on top of the iris, I would, I could have done that, but uh, and then uh, get into the anterior chamber in a more ergonomic way, and then take the foreign body out. We could have taken out this from the, also the sclerotic side, and if I pick the sclerotic side, then I would, uh, I would uh, prefer this uh, nitinol loop uh, foreign body forceps uh, that I use. Uh, it traps the foreign body, but, but if you use, we knew the by by manual maneuver to get the foreign body into the course, it will be more uh, effective. So the case, this specific case, silicone oil remove. This is the left eye with the corneal opacity. Uh, fixes, fixation eye has been performed by a colleague. And what he has glaucoma, both eyes controlled with medication. The vision is 0.5. And uh, you can see that this glaucoma is copying. Apart from it, the retina is uh, OK. But uh, there are some photoreceptor damage around the macular area, uh, foveal area. and uh, I didn't feel I am. I am. So thank you from beautiful Istanbul for your kind attention. Thank you, Noor. Beautiful case. Thank you. And I imagine a very happy patient. Very happy patient, yeah. 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 Uh, the excellent, uh, Noor. I think, uh, I, I think uh, probably even uh, Jan Paolo and uh, even Matthew and myself, uh, we do a lot of trauma, and I think trauma surgery, not trauma. We do a lot of management of trauma, and uh, I think uh, I manage a lot of Kashmir uh, palatocular trauma. So I just put the uh, new claw lens, which is this, uh, devised by my colleague Dr. Manish Papai and myself, which is a four-pronged forceps. Which mm -hmm. uh, I am actually presenting that in the veil vitrectomy meeting because uh, they have said that you should not present anywhere, but I am telling you here. I think it is like a four prong, and when the pellets are engulfed in the vitreous, I don't complete the vitrectomy. I grasp the with the special in, uh, incision between eleven and one, and go grasp the foreign body, remove it off, and then do a airtight, watertight suturing and proceed. I think you have done a wonderful job. Your 2017 retina paper is uh, excellent. So we have it in 2018, a year later. Yes, uh, I already I didn't have any experience to use that claw, but I saw it. It is also nitinol. Also, it's a nice maybe because it's a large one. Apart from it, uh, Natalia, yeah. good good one. Yeah. Any any other comments uh, questions from the audience? I don't see at the moment. Uh, well, I just uh, uh, thank you very yes, much. Thank you. Um, I really like that. And, and you know what? I also just a small comment that you let the patient a fake it. Uh, like also, you know, maybe coming back to Matteo's presentation, which was wonderful. But sometimes, you know, you got to stop, I think, your surgical motivation during surgery and just think through the option to maybe leave an eye also a fake it and go there for a second approach uh, down the road. 
Um, I, I think you can't handle all jobs at once. Sometimes it's not the best solution. Absolutely. And I think this eye looks beautiful and you can now go for a lens uh, solution as well. Generally, when we, when, we, uh, when we illustrate our way of uh, dealing with trauma, we always recommend a staged approach, just like you're saying, Michael. So it's, we get the important points first. First, we want to reconstitute the integrity of the anatomy, outer and outer shell. Then we deal with the retina, obviously. And then it's all a process of reconstructing the eye through uh, lens implantation, dealing with the refractive post-traumatic glaucoma at present. All these things come, I would say, in stages. So as you quite rightly point out, and I think all the panel will agree, we have priorities. We start with just getting the eye back into shape. Uh, if, it's a, if it's an open globe injury, then dealing with the retina quickly because we know that that is the essential part. So within the next 48 to 72 hours after the trauma, at, at most the retina has to be dealt with. And then we work on that to reconstitute and to, to go, give back as much sight as possible. Um, I think we, we have... Um, done a good job uh, um, if there are no more comments uh, i would leave the final words to uh, professor natarajan who has been so kind enough to uh, get you all involved um, i just from my part as uh, evrs president i want to thank you all again it is through you and through your time and through your dedication that we continue to have a wonderful uh, uh, and uh, experience in uh, our professional uh, career of, of learning from each other, as is uh, in our spirit, in, in the spirit of EVRS and the, the spirit of this group of friends that have been sharing experiences for such a long time. Uh, Professor Natarajan, Nati, yes. tell us, you're, yes, you're, yes, you're, uh, you're, you're, happy. are you happy? Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that's the main I'm happy, but I think the main thing I'm missing is meeting all of you and giving That's a hug right. and, and going for the evening parties, and which we are missing. And we'll I, I remember whenever I have time, I visit everybody's clinic, hospital, and except Noor, I have not visited still. But uh, I, I am glad. And I also want to thank uh, Mitali and the entire the Center of Pharmaceuticals. And I want to say that Center of Pharmaceuticals is an, uh, actually an international company, even though it's come from uh, India. And they have the headquarters in uh, Mumbai. I visited. They have a, a big building with the. They have actually given a place for a CME, but unfortunately, because of COVID, I'm not able to go there. She has got a short video. One thing they have the first drug for a, a diabetic foot. And my dream is to work with the companies like that to prevent because we have 77 million diabetics in India. And I want I want to collect data. Second, I want to also uh, prevent diabetic blindness. So we'll we'll have a. We, we, we will have uh, the, uh, I think, so I, th I thank uh, Santa for supporting and she has a short video to show. And before she, you can start sharing the screen, uh, Mitali. And thank thanks you. to my IT team also and your IT team for doing it. And I think uh, uh, the advantage of we are streaming it in Facebook and, and YouTube. Well, thanks to EVRS for permitting us. And I think it's to disseminate knowledge and people can ask questions. And there are some questions in the Facebook I decided I will answer later. And uh, so, Mithal, you can show your video. And, yes. Uh, so I think as Michael put it, we should have it as an international grandmaster. And that's what I used to do it in Marburg and Frankfurt, which I'm missing now. Thanks a lot for you. Thank you. Is invisible. Uh, thank you, Michael. You made it. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, yeah. There's no volume. Yes, sir. Cento Pharmaceuticals has leveraged. Ah. Cento has global footprints in 126 countries. Centaur is fourth largest pharmaceutical company in ophthalmological prescriptions. Centaur Pharmaceuticals has leveraged synergies from its fully integrated operations by conducting clinical trials and manufacturing the API.
Our 50 bedded CRO manufacturing plants and R&D facilities are successfully completed 25 stringent global regulatory inspections including 15 by US FDA. All US FDA inspections that happened in recent past in 2019 had NEIL 483 observations, a rare feat in itself. We have global accreditations from stringent regulatory authorities including US FDA, UK MHRA and ANSM France. Our Cupel range is the number one brand in ophthalmic anti-infective prescriptions. Centaur has complete presence in ophthalmology covering all therapies. In anti-infective range, Ocupol, Ocupol, DX, Centiflox, in anti-allergic range, Ocurist, Ocurist AH, Ocurist Plus, Beforest. In dry eye range, Heal Tears, Relube, Relube DS, in anti-glaucoma range, Drimopress T, Drimopress LS, Glucotim LA. ARMD Ocubless and NSAID Napacent. Centaur is proud to introduce yet another quality product in anti-glaucoma portfolio. Travopter, the dependable Travoprost with preservative-free advantage. Travopter, first time in India. Daily dose tracker on pack. Centaur has successful journey in ophthalmology for more than 30 years and counting. Eyes are beautiful. You keep them so. Centaur commits support. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. I'd thank like you, to Ms. thank Dr. Yes. Natarajan for uh, giving this opportunity. I also, I also would like to tell, yes. Now, I also would like to tell all our friends that the Centaur is open for uh, any clinical trials because they have a 50 bedded uh, clinical uh, hospital where uh, they have ICU for uh, whatever recognition for both Germany and U.S. and many European. So I think I want to do something and by the time the COVID happened, but I hope we can do something on the basic science also with them. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Michael is now in the sunshine and, uh, and Dr. Noor and Darius is in the OT and I'm in the hospital, but uh, I finished my work in the morning. And Carlos and I, I love to be with you and I love your videos in your YouTube. So I want to take this. It's not a, nobody is popularizing each other. I think it's only pure education. And that's why I love EVRS. I, even though I'm part of so many international retina groups in, actively, but I love EVRS and uh, very close to it. And thank you, Matthew. So thank hope you to have you. Your, your movie from Bombay is very good. That, thank uh, you very much. Friends. Thank you. We hope. Bye -bye. We, we yeah. have to say goodbye, but we will meet again, hopefully yeah. in person. And if not, it will be yeah. more well, webinars. As I say, as example, I said we will do one more. If we can call we it. Will do, we will do. We will do many more. We have more planned. We have done uh, eight so far. We'll do more, uh, uh, leading yes. up Great. to our Great. to our national congress, which will be in December. So uh, we have a few more months to meet on. Uh, uh, on on uh, this uh, webinar platform uh, until we meet again personally. Thank you so much. Have a lovely weekend. Sure. Uh, God bless.